The economy laughed at liberal arts majors in 2011. That was me, a doe-eyed creative writing graduate, two years after receiving my degree as the recession continued to percolate through my life, providing me with all kinds of excuses not to do anything with it. Afraid to move on from the comfort of my college town in the Inland Empire, I decided to stick around as long as possible. I lived with my girlfriend near the university, I worked for the university's marketing department, and I supported the Occupy Wall Street movement by liking things on Facebook. <laughs> I was so brave back then. I made a promise to myself that no matter how bad my financial situation got, I would not move home to live with my parents. That's not what college graduates do, I thought. That's not what men do. Men move forward, not backward. Men pay their bills. Men make something of themselves, damn it. And men don't move in with their parents. That's what boys do. But my oath didn't even make it a year, and neither did my relationship. That was around the time I learned that one of the main things keeping people in relationships is the threat of having to pay 100% of the rent. So after my girlfriend and I broke up, I quit my job, called off my pledge, and limped back to my hometown in North County, San Diego. On the drive south, my Honda loaded up with my laundry and my DVD collection. I took a small comfort in knowing I wasn't alone. There were other dispirited members of my graduating class waiting for me there. And as the economically depressed tended to do, we bounced around between odd jobs and gigs and internships, making a little bit of cash here and there, which we mostly spent at bars. The only thing getting me through my first few months of underemployment was spending what little money I had on craft beer I pretended to like. On one such night, a girl caught my eye. It's probably more accurate to say I caught hers, I have a voice that carries, and I was most likely drawing attention to myself by projecting my opinions into the air supply like nerve gas. Her name was Megan. Her name was not Megan, but that's what I'm going to call her. She was cute with short hair, and she was munching on fried cauliflower, which I thought was an interesting choice. And she had a gravelly voice with which she joined me in talking shit about Mitt Romney. Just how I like him. Cute, liberal, argumentative, and named Megan. Election years make dating kind of easy. I acquired her phone number by just agreeing with everything she said. I was 25 and single. She was 35, casually drunk and evidently in the mood to make a bad decision. She added her contact, contact info into my Galaxy S2 and it was game on. I waited a respectful 24 hours to call. I didn't text, I called. I thought a 35 year old would appreciate the old school move. It worked. <laughs> Megan invited me on a Friday night bar crawl and we sailed the craft beer trade winds all night long. I couldn't believe I was with her. I tried to keep the nostalgic college talk to a minimum, figuring there was little value and more reminders of our age discrepancy. This wasn't just another girl, I thought. This was a woman. And women don't want to hear about dorm life and lukewarm mixed drinks and being hung over at 9 a.m. poetry workshops. So I kept the conversation focused on her and continued to buy us round after round from my dwindling bank account. I learned she was vegan, which explained the cauliflower. <laughs> She'd spent a year living in Madrid. She had a dangerously psychotic brother. She paid a mortgage on a nice condo just around the corner, which was where we ended the evening. As I fell asleep next to her, I felt like a man. When I woke up in her bed the next morning, I tried not to think about how that night I would go to sleep in my childhood one. <laughs> to my surprise, it wasn't just a one night thing. I started seeing her on a regular basis, which was exactly what I needed in my moment of post-college identity crisis. It felt good to be desired, and it reminded me of the relationship I used to have. I missed having a girlfriend. And what's more girl-friendly than a girlfriend who's 13 years older than your last girlfriend? If you do the math, that's like 50% more girlfriend. <laughs> so I paid a lot of attention to Megan, and I found myself caring less about who I was or what career I could have, and chose instead to focus mostly on her. I invited her to everything I did. Weekly trivia game nights with my friends, birthday parties, those kind of things. I liked people seeing me with her. She made me feel impressive and visible. So the next time my entire family was in town for a reunion, I invited her along. I showed her off to everyone. My brothers, my parents, my casually racist aunt. Everyone got to meet Megan. 
I did find it a little awkward introducing her to my uncle's latest wife, a woman who was closer to my age than hers. My family scrutinized her, as I suspected they would. We mingled about the house, bouncing from relative to relative. There were a lot of what-do-you-do's and where-did-you-go-to-school questions. I got the feeling my family didn't like Megan, but they never told me directly. They always exercise restraint when one of us chooses an inappropriate person to date. They admirably keep their mouths shut while waiting for you to realize that being with someone is a mistake all on your own. It's healthier that way. There's growth. <laughs> but I didn't care. I was too deep into the Meganverse to concern myself with anyone else's opinion, implied or otherwise, so I just doubled down and excused her worst tendencies. She was the kind of person who looked for any opportunity to correct you, someone who would say things like, you know, you should really cook with coconut oil instead of vegetable oil. <laughs> that soon became me. I succumbed to her influence without even realizing it, combining my opinions with hers like a bored kid mixing Windex with bleach. I parroted all of her snarkiest lessons on nutrition and politics and religion. Nothing was off limits. On my quest to become whoever I was supposed to be, I cut my journey shirt short and simply became her. That election year was filled with opportunities to weaponize her political views. Too many opportunities. I assailed my conservative parents, otherwise known as my roommates, with her thoughts on health care, income inequality, and everything else. I certainly couldn't, Frank, excuse me, Frankly, I'm surprised my folks didn't just put up the money to kick me out of the house and into my first apartment. I certainly couldn't afford rent on my own. But it didn't matter. Megan was paying attention to me. Megan was teaching me about vegan food. Megan was providing me with something to do other than watch Jeopardy at 7.30 every night with my dad. Megan was also sleeping with me. By that point, I'd only ever slept with two women. And like many young men who came before me, logic and forward thinking sort of go out the window when you're getting laid. <laughs> Especially with Megan's version of sex, which was different <laughs> from the other two. Those two did things conventionally. All of the positions made sense, the angles were expected, and it was all over quicker than I'd wished. But Megan's sex was a different kind of calculation. And like every math class I ever took, very little of it made sense. As it turned out, she was into bondage. Handcuffs, dog collars, erotic asphyxiation. I suppose I should be grateful she didn't whip out the chains on our first go at it. Like building up a tolerance for spicy foods, it's best to gradually introduce certain ingredients before you really turn up the heat. She tested the waters with me for a few nights before asking me if I was into it. I said what you're supposed to say to a woman offering you a kind of sex you've never tried before. I'm not not into it. <laughs> the first time she pulled out the dog collar, I had no idea what to do. How could I? I was raised in a Catholic family. <laughs> I had respectful parents who remain married to this day. I watched tame, prosaic porn, content that provided no details on this subject. She fastened the collar around her neck, gave me the chain, and we got started. She was clearly waiting for something, something I wasn't giving her. She told me it was okay, and she told me to pull. I pulled. You know how sometimes during sex your mind goes to strange places? I was having strange sex, so my mind went to stranger places. A memory came back to me of a deep sea fishing trip I took at age 13. There was a bat I was supposed to use to club the fish in the head after I caught them so they wouldn't suffocate, but I could never get it right on the first try. I had to keep whacking the fish until it finally stopped moving. It was very frustrating. I was about as successful at choking this woman as I was at beating sockeye salmon to death. She'd clearly been choked by more willing partners, by saltier semen. I stopped thinking about fishing when she laughed. I didn't really like the sound of that laugh. It had an edge to it, a bit of a condescending, aren't you cute, bite. But whatever, I thought, I can learn new things. I'm a smart guy, I have a creative writing degree. I eventually got the hang of it, but I never liked it. And I couldn't shake the feeling like she was pushing it on me because I didn't like it, testing me somehow. She would do that sometimes. 
One night I drove her home from a bar and she was drunk and rude and laughing at me, trying to rile me up, saying offensive things about my dad and my friends. I focused on the road as she squirmed in the passenger seat like a child. Then she reached across the center console and seized my throat with clawed fingers. I pulled her hand off me and pushed her back against the window a little harder than I meant to. She laughed again. That laugh. Then we stopped for vegan takeout. (laughs) I stuck with her for some reason. There was something about her that inflated my confidence even as she tested my patience. Being with her was an inoculation against fear and doubt. If I could make it with this woman, I could make anything work. I could get a job, a real job. I could find my purpose. I could nail the final Jeopardy clue every goddamn night. But it was never going to work, and it was never supposed to. Was she really looking for something serious? Was I? I didn't consider these questions because I thought this was love. Relationships were hard, and love is complicated, occasionally mean-spirited, and evidently (laughs) plant-based. But this wasn't a relationship. I started to understand that when one night, I became terribly sick. I woke up at 3 a.m., my body doing horrible things to me. Maybe it was all the tofu I had abruptly introduced into my system. In the urgent care center, I collapsed from dehydration and woke up with an IV in my arm. I texted Megan the news and heard no reply. A week passed and still nothing. I understand this is called ghosting nowadays. Eventually, she asked me to come over to her condo. I grabbed some vegan food on the way over. The orange-flavored chicken from Loving Hut was my favorite, so long as I drenched it in plenty of hot sauce. Walking through the door, the heat from the takeout radiating through the bag, all I wanted to do was pick up where we left off. I started unwrapping the bag, but she stopped me and said, We need to talk. I wasn't surprised. She delivered some standard breakup fare about being at different points in our lives. Couldn't really argue about that. I offered little protest because I knew whatever this was had run its course. She retied the bag and gave it to me, which was kind, I suppose. I did pay for it. <laughs> Eventually, my family would tell me about how at that reunion I invited her to, Megan was rude and insulted my future sister-in-law. Eventually, the president would be re-elected. Eventually, I would get a better job and finally move out of my parents' house into an apartment of my own. But before any of that happened, I left her house and lost my appetite for vegan cuisine. I stopped at an in and out for dinner. In pursuit of clarity, the kind of clarity only seasoned beef could provide. I don't know if you call it a triple-triple or a three-by-three. All I know is that it tasted incredible. Thank you. Give it up for Brent Hannafee!